Hi everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here again, coming to you as usual from the China History Podcast dot com. Today is the third installment of our overview of the life of Deng Xiaoping. We look at the period right after Deng and all the heads of the six bureaus were called back to Beijing in 1952. Deng was in the middle of the Xinanju, the Southwest Bureau, and now he is a vice premier and holds this title from 1952 to 55. And then we have the Ba Da, the Eighth Party Congress, September 15th to 27th, 1956, where Mao makes Deng the Party General Secretary. So today we look at this new phase in Deng's life. We saw in the beginning, in parts one and two, how he had the right family connections and enough money to become a part of this European work study program. How he hooked up with Zhou Enlai in France in the 1920s and and first displayed that talent to get things done. He earns that reputation as Doctor Mimeograph and as a fixer, and Zhou Enlai recognizes. Deng's natural talents, and this allows Deng to begin his ascent. So Deng becomes part of Zhou's gang, which of course puts him into Mao's orbit. Deng plays a hands-on role in fighting the Japanese as well as the nationalists. He bleeds for Chairman Mao and repeatedly proves not only his loyalty but also his usefulness to Mao. After liberation, Mao sends Deng to the southwest to clean up that. Whole messy situation down there, which he does, and now he's back in Beijing, and here begins a whole new phase of his life. No more dodging bullets, fighting for his life, and living in caves, and desperately trying to stabilize a brand new country that had only just been born. The PRC was like a newborn baby in some respects, and the first couple years truly needed special treatment. I mean, talk about intensive care. But Deng. Did his part, as did many others, and now they had come this far. Deng is in the middle of the power center. He's in Beijing, at the very center of all the top-level decision making, with regular access to Mao and in Mao's good graces. We're talking like fifty-two to fifty-six. Man, what a time that was! Now I wasn't born yet, but those were some major Cold War years. But in China, the fun is already starting, and the party is already taking the knife and starting to trim off all the fat in the CCP. You have the three antis campaign, which targeted Mao's three pet peeves of corruption, waste, and bureaucracy. That one commenced toward the latter half of 1951, and then this was followed by the five antis campaign, which followed in January 1952, where the bourgeoisie. Which in China was anyone in the middle class or who owned anything or had once owned property. In this campaign, they found themselves on the wrong side of the party line, so it didn't take long for all these campaigns to start blasting off one after the other. And you can imagine the amount of dread and apprehension it caused in normal everyday society. By the end of 1952, everyone was learning the new rules under the new system. Now remember, from the last episode, China is still neck deep in the Korean War, and the twin fears of a U.S. and/or nationalist invasion was still a dreaded and very realistic concern. So to say that Mao and the top layer were paranoid about any bad apples in the party possibly spoiling the whole bunch is an understatement. So Deng is assuming his position of power in Beijing under these circumstances. He toes the party line as always. He's initially made the finance minister, replacing Bo Yibo, who fell from favor during the Gaogang affair, the Gaorao conspiracy. That's the first major leadership crisis the party faced after liberation. Gaogang and Rao Shushi, two regional leaders, they started making moves against Liu Shaoqi and Zhou Enlai, and Deng. Handled this matter with Mao's blessing, and these guys were later expelled from the party, but caused a big shakeup. And you know who needs these kind of power struggles so early in the game? Is finance minister one of the things on Deng's plate? Was the very difficult task of going out to all the provinces to discuss the two issues that's always on everyone's mind, which of course. 
how much tax they're going to remit to the central government, and how much grain they're going to come up with. Then, the way it works on a very simple level, the central government lets them know how much the number actually has to be. This was a very hard job, and these governors and party officials in the provinces, especially Guangdong, Fujian, and the southernmost provinces, they always had their own ideas. But Deng carried this job out, and he reported directly to the two top guys, Mao and Zhou. 1954, Deng is made secretary general to the party, Central Committee. In this position, he's basically the man in charge of all the daily party work. All the practical nuts and bolts of everything and everything the Communist Party did was ultimately managed by Deng, and this was on Mao's order. The following year, in 1955, Deng is made a member of the Politburo. So you can see, in 1978 and into the 80s, when everyone talks about what a great leader Deng Xiaoping was, look who he learned from. For military matters, party politics, communist theory, there was Mao. For diplomacy, matters of state, practical matters, who could beat Zhou Enlai? So Deng Xiaoping had a very, very fine education in the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. So let's jump to 1956. This was another milestone for Deng in that he led the Chinese delegation to Moscow attending the historic 20th Soviet Party Congress. He and Zhu De were the two guys from China attending. This is the famous February meeting in Moscow where Khrushchev gave the so-called secret speech that denounced Stalin and, among other things, sort of forced a crisis for Mao. It was Deng who, although not present at the actual secret meeting itself where Stalin was denounced, he did get a copy of Khrushchev's speech the next day and personally reported the bad news to Mao. I cannot imagine how tense that moment must have been. Deng knew this was dynamite of the first order. All this stuff Khrushchev was dredging up and saying about Stalin, much of it you could say the exact same thing about Mao egomaniac trying to glorify himself and the witch hunts and the innocent party members labeled counter-revolutionaries. I mean, when Deng Xiaoping read this text, he must have thought to himself, oh boy, you know, Chairman Mao isn't going to like this thing. And if all this wasn't bad enough and embarrassing to Mao, Khrushchev was also outright rejecting the several core beliefs that Mao was totally hanging his hat on. This included the whole idea that war was inevitable, between the capitalist world powers and the communist world, Khrushchev was saying, well, you know, maybe we can find a way to coexist. And Mao was thinking this totally goes against what he had always preached. You know, up to this moment, the Soviet Union was more than just a neighbor and ideological partner. This whole thing was a real headache for Mao and infuriated him to no end. So Deng he had to be the messenger on that one. The Sino-Soviet split is still six years away, but this was a major 9.0 earthquake to the friendship and the relations. The relationship is already starting to head south, but after Khrushchev's secret speech, there was no saving it. From, from this point on, it's, it's, a, it's a steady slide down a slick mountain with a stiff wind at their backs. And the man that Mao put in charge of Sino-Soviet relations, the one who managed the whole split, was Deng. On another day, we're going to take a look at the whole long, tortured history of China and the Soviet Union. There were still occasional get-togethers between Chinese leaders and Soviet leaders, but the tone of these meetings was always as frosty as a January night in Harbin. But Mao was a practical man when he needed to be, and he thought, well, why not? And in a special meeting on May 2nd, 1956, he said the famous and iconic words, let a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend. Then Mao promptly went to the historical and revolutionary city of Wuhan and did one of his famous swims in the Yangtze River to show everyone he still had it at the age of 63. He'll repeat this feat again ten years later when he launches the Cultural Revolution. Four months after Mao's symbolic swim, the next big event in Deng's life was the Ba Da, the Eighth Party Congress. This is where Deng will be made General Secretary of the Party, a much bigger role now. With this promotion, Deng is now ranked number four in the party hierarchy. This was the first party congress in 11 years, the first since the founding of the PRC. 
the party secretariat, by the way, is the chief guy in charge of the party bureaucracy, which is even bigger than you can imagine. He's also responsible to handle the implementation of anything that gets decided. And lastly, he has a hand in deciding anything related to the hiring of new people. So, September 1956, the Eighth Party Congress is held, and Deng is riding high and in a very big position of power and decision-making authority in China. He was in charge of the drafting of the new party constitution and played a role in taking Mao Zedong thought out of the constitution. And as Deng will later find out, he pays a price for this one later on when he is attacked during the Cultural Revolution. But most all agreed, with Khrushchev's speech and all, it would be best to tone things down a notch and remove Mao thought from the Constitution. But as we'll find out, one of these days, the Cultural Revolution was a time where many innocent remarks, past decisions, and unremarkable events will come back and haunt people with a vengeance the modern world has hardly ever seen. April 1957, the Hundred Flowers movement takes off and Deng went along with Mao on this against his best interests. Intellectuals and former capitalists who had kept their mouths shut all this time were cajoled, chided, and pushed to speak up and say whatever they wanted to say about the CCP. Then, in theory, there would be this constructive criticism that could be studied and the party could become stronger. This was the basic rationale behind the Hundred Flowers movement. Well, April, May, and into June, the party just got savaged. Intellectuals spoke up for the first time, and man, did they ever let the CCP have it. Well, the criticism got to be so bad from the Hundred Flowers campaign that Mao said this whole bad idea had to stop. And so Deng Xiaoping is called in to head what became known as the anti-rightist campaign, the Fan Yu Pai Yun Dong. A few hundred thousand souls got caught up in this dragnet that tried to weed out the less politically reliable and enthusiastic party members. This movement went after rightists, which was a code word for anyone against the party. And if you were an intellectual or someone considered part of the capitalist class, you most likely got caught up in this whole mess, too. And Deng Xiaoping was the man in charge of this roundup. You know, that's why, depending on where you stand in the political spectrum, not everyone puts Deng Xiaoping on a pedestal. Although he's known today as this great reformer who brought this huge change to China, at the heart, he was and remained a hardcore, dedicated Communist Party leader who looked out for the interests of the party and didn't waver when the going got rough. So we see this here in the anti-rightist movement that followed the Hundred Flowers campaign, and we'll see it again in 1989 when the Tiananmen incident goes down on June 4th. When he took orders from Mao, he carried them out, no matter how unpopular he thought they would be or how history might judge his actions or association with certain events. Then, after Mao passed and Deng became the top power in China, he wasn't afraid to make the difficult choices. I mean, making difficult and unpopular decisions is something politicians try and stay away from. Real leaders don't fear these kinds of things. Anyway, back to the story. Deng is in daily charge of the levers of the party, which essentially controls the government. He does a masterful job and is hands-on involved in almost every single aspect of party decisions. And he was already at this early pre-Great Leap Forward stage, espousing a belief that political and social problems in China could be ameliorated by economic solutions. But Deng's sober management of the party and the state wasn't meant to be. Just when things were starting to look hopeful, the Korean War is over, good and capable founding fathers like Deng, Liu, Zhou, and so many others by this time had China somewhat stabilized and in a good place from which to start growing economically and diplomatically. But it all wasn't meant to be. At the third plenum of the 8th Central Committee, the whole Great Leap Forward thing gets put on the stove and everyone is sort of railroaded into supporting it, Deng included. In fact, as head of the CCP Secretariat, Deng Xiaoping had a major hand in managing the Great Leap Forward. Now, if you go to the early episode, uh, China History Podcast number four, 
there's a 24-minute overview giving the details of the Great Leap Forward. So I won't go into the gory details here in this segment. But as far as Deng Xiaoping is concerned, he went on the same inspection tours as all the other leaders in the winter of 1958-59. Deng saw the same wretched misery as Peng De Huai and everyone else. So although word had spread prior to these inspection tours that this whole Great Leap Forward thing wasn't going too well, it was by early 1959 that the alarm bells started being rung everywhere. So now, on top of everything else, Deng, in his position of power, had to add this to the list. How to get as many people fed as possible with whatever meager food supplies there were. And on the political front, Deng had to walk that knife edge of being supportive to the party line, as laid down by Mao, and at the same time not letting the country go down in flames by a self-inflicted wound. So, 1960, the Great Leap Forward ends, and not soon enough. Mao, as he said he would, retires to the so-called second line of politics, meaning he was stepping down and would henceforth only play a behind-the-scenes supporting and advisory role. Okay, 1960, Mao is seemingly out of the way, and now Deng Xiaoping and the other leaders have to clean up this unmitigated disaster. You know, we look at China today, and there's plenty of news talking about all the political and social problems China has today, and how are they ever going to get through all these things? Well, tough times are nothing new to China's leadership. And when you think about past upheavals, where it was felt China might never bounce back, time and again, just when the going gets rough, China makes a comeback, and such was the case in 1960. That was a rough year. And so now we enter into this period of reconstruction. And during this period, China is shut down tighter than a drum. Nobody was let in and nobody was let out unless they, you know, of course, faced extreme scrutiny. The Sino-Soviet split is about to happen. And of course, relations with the U.S. are non-existent. Deng and Liu were essentially the two main guys in charge of party affairs. Zhou Enlai took care of, you know, matters of state. Deng and Liu started laying down the seeds of their own demise. You see, later on, when the Cultural Revolution happened, one of the main beefs the Red Guards had was that Deng and Liu had sort of pushed Mao in the back seat and never gave him any face or sought his wisdom and just plain old didn't give him his due. And if this wasn't bad enough, Deng and Liu introduced all these capitalist policies in the countryside to spur economic growth that proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that they were capitalist rotors of the first rate. But in January 1960, Mao had said in a top-level meeting that Deng Xiaoping was his deputy in public, even though Deng was officially ranked fourth in the party pecking order. Oh, that Mao, he was such a kidder. He liked to stir things up. You see, Liu Shaoqi was the number two party guy. So he should have been Mao's deputy. So this put Deng Xiaoping in a bind. If Mao kept going around Liu to Deng, then Deng was in open conflict with Liu. But if he didn't continue on with his total loyalty to Mao, who knows what could happen? Probably nothing good. So Deng took a step back and just tried to disassociate himself from the day-to-day affairs and to just not get sucked into Mao's game by the very fact that he wasn't involved. He hung out a lot with Hu Yaobang and Wan Li, playing bridge and watching soccer, and man, did he ever catch hell about this later on during the Cultural Revolution. So Deng, Zhou, and Liu, and others all worked to repair the damage from the Great Leap Forward, and it's no secret they experimented with all kinds of policies that were capitalist and offered economic incentives to spur production and efficiency. They carried out all kinds of experiments. Some worked, some didn't. And it was these five years, between the end of the Great Leap Forward and the start of the Cultural Revolution in 1966, that a lot of the policies and ideas that were experimented with would later be implemented again in the 1980s. In fact, during these years, Deng's gang, who would lead the whole reform movement in the 80s, all got their training during this period. 
One of the closest supporters of Deng, who worked with him tirelessly during this period in the early 60s, was Beijing Mayor Peng Zhen. We'll see later on when the first axe falls during the Cultural Revolution. It's Mayor Peng who feels it. But we're not there yet. We're still in the early 60s, and Deng Xiaoping is still doing his best, along with other pragmatists, technocrats, and party faithful, to mop up from the Great Leap Forward. No one could agree on what to do. In January 62, it was learned that the economy was much worse and the future prospects not looking too good either. And under these circumstances, in this painful year of 1962, in response to something Lin Biao had mentioned about you know, communist theory or something Mao once said, Deng uttered the famous words, a saying from his native Sichuan, that became his trademark. Quote, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white, so long as it catches mice. And may I say, boy, did this come back to haunt him again during the Cultural Revolution. Even back in 1962, Deng had second thoughts about including this line into the official text of his speech. Well, by this time, Mao had already made it known he was no dead ancestor, and he must have felt he had stayed on the sidelines long enough because he pushed through what became known as the Socialist Education Movement. I don't know, maybe you could call this a harbinger of things to come. Mao was trying to use his still hefty influence to push back against all these things Deng and others had started experimenting with. The Socialist Education Movement, was meant to increase everyone's revolutionary spirit. Intellectuals were sent down to the countryside to learn from the peasants, and there were a lot of meetings. I mean, it wasn't only aimed at the people, but the party as well. This was one of those painful exercises that the PRC was getting used to. Those in the government and the Lao Bai Xing as well. Meetings, slogans, new colorful propaganda posters, self-criticisms being... Careful what you say in public and to others. Everybody's sort of going on trying to live their life and at the same time show the proper amount of dedication and enthusiasm that was required in the new China society. Of course, there were people who embraced these campaigns, but I guess it depended on where you were in Chinese society at the time that influenced how you looked at these things. These yun dong, or campaigns, as an American, are really strange to me, because as far as I know, although we have movements, we don't have this tradition like in China with government-sponsored national campaigns. These always fascinated me. Well, Deng and Liu, they didn't embrace this socialist education movement with enough gusto for Mao. And by 1965, Mao is already making noises about <clears throat> certain people who are in a position of authority, who are taking the capitalist road. Hmm, I wonder who that can be. From the end of the Great Leap Forward to the Cultural Revolution, Deng had his hands full trying to get the country working again, deal with the famine, reconcile the Great Leap, continue to build and improve the party, and now he has to deal with an angry Mao Zedong who's trying to get back into the game after voluntarily taking himself out of the game after his disastrous idea the Great Leap Forward. But in between these two disasters, Mao was finding it hard to get the party establishment to get enthused about his socialist education movement and all these other campaigns he wanted to launch. He was busy trying to stay relevant, and we see Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi busy trying to attend to more pressing and practical matters. And although Deng continues to pay lip service to all these campaigns and whatnot, he didn't show Mao enough face. So Mao began to turn to three people who were more than happy to make him happy. And these were none other than Lin Biao and someone who could have taught a thing or two to the cruel Han Dynasty Empress Liu. And this is Mao's fourth wife, Jiang Qing. Mao had an early arranged marriage to a girl from Hunan, and then he's married to his teacher's daughter, Yang Kai Hui, who was the mother to all of Mao's children. Mao's third wife was He Zhen, who we met during the Jingangshan days, during the Jiangxi Soviet. And then he divorced her in 1937 in order to marry Jiangqing. 
And the third person, we mentioned Lin Biao Jiangqing, the third person who Mao knew he could turn to for anything and who was more than happy to tell Mao all the time how great he was, was the topic of our CHP number 11 podcast, Kang Sheng. And it was Kang who was the behind-the-scenes facilitator of Mao's divorce from He Zhen in order to clear the decks for Jiang Qing to come on board. So go listen to that one if you haven't already. Now we're going to take a nice long look at Jiang Qing one day, but most of you have heard of her and know who she was. And of course, she had a 25% shareholding in the Gang of Four. Now, for the purposes of this episode, she was a blood enemy of Deng Xiaoping. And having the air of the chairman and all, she probably heard a lot from her husband about how much it bothered him that none of these other party elites were paying any heed to his ideas. So she teamed up with Lin Biao and Kang Sheng, and they formed a nice political alliance that catered to Mao's whims and fed him whatever xiao bao gao, or you know, political gossip that they knew would give him a jolt or make him feel good. For example, during the uh, Learn from the PLA campaign in 1963, Lin coordinated the compilation of Mao's greatest hits from the 40s and 50s and put them all in this volume that became known to history as the iconic Little Red Book. We'll hear more about this slim little book later on. As for Jiang Qing, Mao put her in charge of rectification of the arts and literature. But here we go, it's all starting. I mean, as far as this Ren Wu, this job that Mao gave her, Jiang Qing, being a former actress and all, she was able to, you know, claim some sort of expertise in this field. And he always said to, you know, the other leaders, you know, back in the Yan'an days, eh, don't worry, don't worry, you know, Jiang Qing, she's never going to get involved in politics, you know, or, you know, as the agreement went, you know, she won't get involved in any politics for at least 30 years. Well, it's not quite 30 years, but... As we'll see, ambition is like love. It's impatient, both of delays and rivals, as uh, Sir John Denham put it. Jiang Qing's ace in the hole was her guanxi with Mao. So in these lead-up years to the Cultural Revolution, you'll see her stirring up the you-know-what to give Deng and Liu, and Liu Shaoqi's wife, man, did Jiang Qing not like her. You have to Plant seeds first before you get the flowers. And this was the time for Jiang Qing. So you can now see the storm clouds are starting to gather in the early to mid-60s. And let me tell you, Deng Xiaoping was no fan of Jiang Qing. No fan of her personally and no fan of all these revolutionary operas and performances that she acted in the role of the uh, impresario. He was always trying to get out of going to these performances. And famously, when he once went to one where, you know, it would have been too politically awkward not to go, he nodded off to sleep. I mean, open enmity between these two. Something about Jiang Qing and everything she was and everything she stood for was never going to see eye to eye with a guy who was famous for saying, sure, sure, chill, sure, you know, seek truth from facts. Dung on several occasions dissed Jiang Qing and made it be known he didn't take her seriously. And of course, this infuriated her. And we'll see later on how she exacts her revenge on Deng and his whole family. So we're sort of brushing up against the whole cultural revolution here. So I think we're going to stop for now. Next time, we'll pick up in 1966. Not a good year for Deng Xiaoping. And an even worse year for Liu Shaoqi and a lot of sacred cows and the first generation of leadership of the CCP. We'll look at the Wenhua Da Ge Ming from the perspective of how it affected Deng. As you know, this is one of the great stories of survival, and we'll cover all that in part four of the life of Deng Xiaoping. So that's it for me. This is Laszlo Montgomery bidding you all a fond and friendly farewell from where else? Claremont, California, the World Center in Process Theology, Join us next week, if you're so inclined, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. And to all my fellow Americanskis all over this blessed land and around the world, Ganon Jia Happy Thanksgiving!